You know, uh, when I come to speak to a group like this, I realize that you guys know more about creation than I do, which is kind of intimidating as a speaker to come to a group that could probably uh, know every subject that I was going to talk about better than myself. So I really prayed about it, and I began to realize that I could tell you a story today that I bet nobody in this room has really heard before. I'm going to tell you a story about a volcano that most creationists don't know about. And like Mark mentioned, the way I know about it is there's a gentleman who uh, went and explored this volcano, and then he came to, uh, to us and asked us to produce a video documentary. Uh, we're hoping that that documentary will be done soon, someday. Um, but, uh, so that's the reason that I have the information on this particular uh, video. By the way, I'm going to show you lots of images today. Uh, I'm also going to play some audio for you because, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, our family created Jonathan Park, which is an audio series, so I'm always doing audio. So there's going to be some points during our presentation today where it's just audio, so I hope that's not too awkward. People don't know what to do with their eyes when audio is playing, but uh, if you'll just go along with it and just maybe sit and look at the, the uh, screen, that would be great. Today I'm going to tell you a story, and it's a story of action and adventure and science and Bible and I'm even going to throw in a little bit of romance, too. Okay? You guys probably always get romance here at the, the DSA meetings, don't you? <laughs> well, clear back with uh, James Hutton and Charles Lyell, they talked about how layers took millions of years to form. Christians didn't know what to do with that. But creationists always pointed out that maybe there could be a catastrophe in the past that could form layers very rapidly. And so the debate was on. But as you guys know, in 1980, God actually set up the experiment and changed the debate for all times. Mount St. Helens showed for all times that layers could form in hours, canyon systems in months, and even something that looked like petrified forests in a matter of years. It is amazing how Mount St. Helens has changed the entire debate, and so many lives have been changed by what happened at Mount St. Helens. But what if there was a volcano that was 30 times more powerful than Mount St. Helens? So now I'm gonna ask you to please travel back with me a little over 100 years ago. On June 1st, 1912, earthquakes were beginning to rock a little Indian village settlement of Katmai Village. Soon families from this area would flee for their lives. The village was located on the Alaskan Peninsula across from Kodiak Island. Late in the evening of the 5th, observers at Cold Bay, 40 miles to the southwest, saw that the northern sky had turned black and stormy, even though the skies were completely clear on the coast. Something big was about to happen. I do not know whether we shall be either alive or well. We are awaiting death at any moment. Of course, do not be alarmed. A mountain has burst near here, so that we are covered in ash, in some places 10 feet and 6 feet deep. All this began on the 6th of June. Night and day we light lamps. We cannot see daylight. In a word, it is terrible. And we are expecting death at any moment. And we have no water. All the rivers are covered in ash, just ashes mixed with water. Here are darkness, hell, and thunder, and noise. I do not know whether it is day or night. Vanka will tell you all about it. So kissing and blessing you both. Goodbye. That was an actual excerpt from a letter written by Ivan, who is a native, a native fisherman, and he wrote that to his wife and to his family. On June 6, the ground started to shake so violently, Kodiak Island heard the blast and saw the ash cloud from 100 miles away. Ash fell for three days, covering the area. It was said that the darkness was so thick during the day of June 8th that it was impossible to, for, uh, to see a, a, la a lantern held at arm's length. The ash from the eruption traveled over Europe, North America, and all the way down to Algeria. The people of Kodiak Island, they didn't know what was going on. They became overcome with fear and remembered the horrible stories about the eruption of Pompeii, right? They were thinking about that. So on June 8th, they all boarded a boat called the Manning, and they headed out to sea to get away from the land. 
And there they stood, hungry, thirsty, and scared for two days, in total darkness, hoping to survive, with no idea of what was going on. People who lived in Juneau, 750 miles away from the volcano, heard the eruption about an hour after it happened. Isn't that cool? The sound took an hour to travel to Juneau. Nobody knew what was going on. For two and a half days, tall, dark columns of ash and poisonous gases spewed into the air. Sulfuric acid rain, uh, sulfuric acid rain tarnished brass as far away as Seattle. Back in the peninsula, a river of superheated gases, ash, and dust flowed through the valley of Knife Creek, instantly killing all life and flattening the ground into a wide plain. It solidified over 1,200 square miles, forming rock 656 feet thick in some places. Well, National Geographic sent some explorers in to check it out two years after the eruption took place. And they sent a man by the name of uh, Dr. Robert Griggs. Today I saw a sight no human being has ever laid eyes on. A region in the great Alaskan wilderness laid bare by a volcanic eruption. The utter devastation will make further exploration difficult. My team and I are running low on supplies. This evening I have left base camp alone to do some scouting. I have not seen an animal or any living creature since entering the blast zone. Tomorrow we hope to send an expedition out from the base camp to find Nova Rupta. I'm overwhelmed by the amazing power of one volcano to completely change the entire landscape. We have pitched our tent away from the danger of avalanche from the rocks rolling off the mountains around us. This is such a harsh environment. I know danger is a constant concern, but we're determined to press on. I hope the words on the pages of this journal inspire future generations to explore this amazing place. So Dr. Robert Griggs led three different expeditions into the uh, Katmai area and uh, to check out the volcano. Griggs and his team faced quicksand, high winds, pumice storms, raging rivers, and falling boulders. They have got so many accounts of what took place during the expedition. These were high adventure expeditions that these guys were on and uh, just exciting stories that took place. Here's uh, some actual footage of them actually uh, climbing up over uh, one of the ridges there. Here's another picture of one of their team members. Now as they would cross rivers, they had to be careful because the material was still filling in the river and you couldn't tell what was solid ground and what was not. And they found out that you could plunge right through the material of the river and instantly be over your head in the water. On one day of the expedition, Dr. Robert Griggs and Folsom, a man by the name of Folsom, headed out to explore a new area. They left behind one of their team, a man named Church. He left him behind because he had eaten too many pancakes that day and he felt like he couldn't hike. So Dr. Griggs and Folsom himself headed out uh, to do some exploring and unfortunately that cost Church um, the opportunity of one of the most exciting discoveries during the trip. Should we proceed further, Griggs? Church is probably wondering if we've been dispatched. Poor Church, incapacitated by too many pancakes. At least we had someone to stay back and watch our gear. I must say that I've been utterly surprised by the lack of volcanic activity that I thought would be manifesting itself in such short order after such a grand eruption. I would agree, Folsom. Okay, I think we need to get back to where Church is waiting. All right. The steam we thought we were pursuing has shown itself to be nothing more than clouds. Wait! Folsom, what do you see down there in the floor of the pass? It appears to be a miniature volcano jetting steam. The binoculars reveal that you are correct. What do we do now? I feel we owe it to church to turn back. We'll return with him. Okay, follow me back. Yes, sir. What's wrong, sir? When I turned back at you, I couldn't help but stare down the valley. Look, more steam. I know church is waiting for us. But he can wait a little longer. Awesome. Follow me. Oh, wow. Awesome. Look what we 
we've discovered. The valley's dotted with hundreds. No, 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 thousands. Could it be 10,000? Oh, fumaroles. It looks as if all the steam engines of the world have been assembled together and have popped their safety valves at once and are letting off a surplus of steam in concert. Griggs, we need to get down there and have a closer look. Let's go. So Griggs discovered the Valley of 10,000 Smokes on his 1916 expedition four years after the eruption actually took place. Here's a quote from uh, Dr. Griggs about finding the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. The whole valley, as far as the eye could reach, was full of hundreds, no, thousands, literally tens of thousands of smokes curling up from its uh, fissured floor. The first glance was enough to assure us that we had stumbled into another Yellowstone Park, unseen and unsuspected by white man and native alike until this hour. I tried to keep my head and observe carefully, yet I exposed two films from one of my precious rolls in trying, uh, trying for pictures that I should have known were impossible. It was though all the steam engines in the world assembled together and had popped their safety valves and at once were letting off surplus steam in concert. Here's kind of a picture of them at one of the fumaroles. Here they are letting down a, uh, uh, an experiment to, uh, to measure the, uh, the temperature of the fumaroles. Now here's the actual Nova Rumpta event, and this is what it looked like when Griggs uh, actually showed up on the scene. So you can see that uh, it's still venting a little bit there. Now on one of his expeditions, he took his wife. And here's a picture of them, Robert and Laura Griggs crossing a river together. Here's their base camp, one of their base camps. Now the amazing thing about uh, their base camp was uh, there's an amazing story with Dr. Griggs is they were in their base camp one night and the wind began whipping so hard that uh, it began just blowing everything away. It started blowing their equipment away, ripped their tents, started to blow everything away, and they realized that there was no way they could survive the night there, so they started to run down the valley. As they were beginning to run, this huge gust of wind came and literally picked Griggs up off the ground and carried him down the valley a little bit. Fortunately, he landed on his feet in the pumice and was safe. But what an adventure that would be to be whipped up with the wind, right? Here's another picture of Dr. Robert Griggs writing in his journal. Okay, here's a picture of the camp after uh, the wind uh, had come. They went back to see what was left. <laughs> now, here's the way they cooked their food on the expedition is they actually cooked their food on the uh, fumaroles. <laughs> so you can see that they just attached a stick to a frying pan and put it over one of the vents that's there. Here's another discovery they made. Um, they, uh, they found uh, this, this canyon that had been carved by a flood. A landslide slide triggered by the earthquakes during the 1912 eruption dammed the Katmai River in, the, in, in Katmai Canyon. The Katmai River remained dammed for three years until a very heavy snow melt in 1915. The dam was breached and an enormous flood broke out into Katmai Canyon. Later, that dam broke and released enough water to move 33 million cubic yards of material in a matter of hours. Many creation geologists talk about the idea that Grand Canyon might have been carved by a natural dam that breached and the water went through and carved the canyon very quickly. At Nova Rupta, we've got the actual proof that that can happen. That canyon was carved by that exact method. Very interesting. Okay, Dr. Griggs uh, talking about that. I found the countryside ravaged by a great flood whose waters were just uh, subsiding. Okay, so they were there to see the action of that flood. A great volume of debris were also transported during this event. The tidal flat area six miles wide was choked with pumice and ash, turning up uh, river stretches of land into quicksand and destroying Katmai Village. So there you go, the power of a flood. It really helps us to think of the processes that might have been going on during the worldwide flood. Okay, trees were snapped off near the ground for several miles by the violent impact of the water. A, a fan of huge boulders were deposited at the mouth of the canyon, and the water volume was so great that it flooded the valley to a depth of approximately 10 feet. Well, Dr. Robert Griggs did a wonderful job leading these expeditions, and he was actually commended 
by the president of National Geographic. He said, their intrepid, intelligent, and faithful services achieved results of historic value and reflect great credit on all participants. Okay, so they did a great job exploring the area. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Griggs was also very key in helping to make that become a national park, which uh, many, many people go to visit nowadays, the Katmai National Park. Well, Dr. Griggs also wrote a book, and you can actually find this book online if you would like, The Valley of 10,000 Smokes, and it actually documents their expeditions and what they discovered. This is a great book to read. If you like adventure and creation, I would suggest that you read the book. Okay, I would like for you to uh, travel with me almost 100 years into the future, which is now. <laughs> This is Dr. David Shorman. Dr. David Shorman loved to lead expeditions to go fishing in Alaska. And they would go to Katmai Park on several occasions. And one time he was in the visitor center there at Katmai Park. And while he was there, he found a book that was referencing Dr. Griggs' book. And so he came home from that trip and he downloaded uh, the book from online and he began to read the book and he went, wow. This has got so many amazing creationist implications. He goes, I want to research this further. And then he began to think about it. And he began to realize that he had led several uh, trips to the Katmai area. Why not lead an expedition to Nova Rupta itself? Now, Dr. Shorman used to live in Texas at the time. And so he actually put together a team to go and investigate the volcano. OK, so we're going to talk about two different expeditions today that uh, Dr. Shorman led. We're going to talk about the first one, then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and talk shortly about the, the second expedition that they took. OK, so they are on their way to go see Nova Rupta. Here is their team, left to right. Kenny, which is Dr. Shorman's uh, stepson. Next to him is Joel, who's a young and accomplished explorer. Mike, who is a seasoned leader who had accompanied uh, Dr. Shorman on many different adventures. OK, and then uh, the boy next to him is John, Mike's son who had recently broken his back before they went on the expedition. Can you believe it? And then there's Tommy, who was just kind of a thrill seeker. He loved going out there and loved having the adventure. OK, here is uh, Dr. Shorman and Kenny. Basically, what uh, they did was they decided to break into two different teams because they had to arrive at two different times because part of the group had something else they had to be at. And so Dr. Shorman and Kenny headed out first to go on the trip. And what they were going to do is they were going to hike to the cabins that are near the vent and stay there. And then they were going to have the rest of the team join them. OK? So the only way to get to Katmai National Park is by a boat or a, flat pl uh, a float plane. And you can see where it's located there, out on the Alaska Peninsula. OK, they spent their first day at uh, Brooks Lodge. Now, you guys have all seen the picture of the uh, salmon jumping into the bear's mouth. OK, that's where this is at. And I guess that's a pretty common occurrence is salmon jumping into bears' mouths there. OK, so that's where they were at. OK, so there they are spending that first night. Um, uh, actually, this was uh, their second night. I'm sorry. They ca uh, uh, came into uh, and spent the night along the Buttress Mountain Range, which is 3,356 feet above sea level. And the whole night, the wind was just howling and whipping. OK? Just very, very high winds that were there. OK, one of the other things they had to do was cross the rivers. The rivers were very dangerous because they were cold. Now, you're going to see pictures later where they're actually in swimsuits. They figured that it was better to keep their, uh, their clothes dry. So a lot of times, they were crossing in shorts or swimsuits. And remember, they had to have a stick to make sure that they weren't going to fall into a hole as they were going through. Also, they could be swept down river very quickly. And if they were swept down river, um, you know, uh, they would be swept down a long ways down. And who knows what would happen then. So it was very dangerous as they were crossing these rivers. Matter of fact, when I talked to Kenny, the stepson of Dr. Shorman, he said, Pat, one of my most unfavorite parts was the river. Every time we came up to a river, I just was not looking forward to crossing the river. Cold, miserable, and dangerous, OK? But one of the things that Dr. Shorman thought about as he was crossing these rivers is the stream power law. This equation is used by many scientists to determine the age of a stream or a river. It takes into account the rate of erosion, the hardness of the material, 
the stream is, uh, oh, the hardness of the material the stream is flowing through, the size of its drainage area, and the slope of the water flowing. Supposedly using this equation, scientists can figure out how long a river has been cutting through its riverbed. Okay. Well, Dr. Griggs discovered that the river Lathe uh, had cut 100 foot uh, deep canyons in the first five years. That's the rate of 20 feet per year, but when they showed up on the scene, it was no longer doing that. And so there was something in the past that had acted catastrophically that carved those river canyons much quicker. Well, if somebody was going to show up and take a look at the, the river Leth now and didn't know the story behind it, they would calculate all of that and they would come out with a much uh, longer age for that river. And so that's one of the things at Nova Rupta that Dr. Shorman was looking into. Okay, one of the things that was just interesting is as you're walking around, hiking around out there, it's all pumice, okay? Volcanic pumice, which is very light. You can see that the guys were really having fun with those rocks, right? But later on, the pumice went from being a friend to being their enemy. Matter of fact, when they were hiking, a lot of times these pumice storms would happen and I think it was about every five minutes or so, a pumice storm would come and basically, if you had any skin um, that was exposed, it would literally sand your skin. So it's hitting your eyes, scouring your face, scouring your hands. So basically what would happen is as they were walking, they said that they could hear up uh, in some of the upper ridges and canyons, they would hear something that sounded like a freight train. And they would realize that when they heard the freight train sound, that they only had a few uh, minutes to get down on the ground and completely cover themselves. And they were, so they would let it go past, all the pumice would just be pummeling them, and then they would get back up and start walking again, and then five minutes later they would hear the, the freight train coming, and then they would have to hit the ground again and cover themselves. So it was really an amazing thing that they had to battle out. It's one of the same things that Dr. Griggs battled out. Well, that night, they eventually arrived at the cabins. Here's what I mean by cabins. <laughs> Very luxurious. Very luxurious. Okay. okay, these are U.S. cabins at the... I heard somebody say five-star, yep. Okay, these are the U.S. cabins at the uh, foot of Baked Mountain, okay? And uh, they're just little shelters that have been built there that many explorers stop and spend the night in. So basically, they based themselves out of these uh, little cabins uh, for the few days that they were there. Here's what they look like on the inside there. You're right, five-star accommodation. Okay, meanwhile, the rest of the team was spending the night back at the Buttress Mountains where they had been the night before. The wind was whipping so hard that Joel was praying to God that they wouldn't fly away. He was thinking about Dr. Griggs, right? Dear Lord, please don't let me be like Dr. Griggs and, and get blown away. Meanwhile... Uh, Dr. Shorman and Kenny were on their way to the actual uh, Nova Rupt event. So as you can see, that's the Nova Rupt event. He's walking around the, uh, the lava dome that's there. Now, when I first saw Nova Rupt, I was expecting this amazing volcano. I'm going to tell you later about how it erupted, but the first time I saw a picture, I went, this doesn't look as impressive as I had hoped it would. Okay? But we're going to talk about it. It actually was a very impressive uh, volcano. Here's, uh, here's the lava dome again. There are 700 feet thick volcanic uh, deposits around the vent, and most of what happened in the first teen s that came from the first 16 hours of the eruption. Okay, now while they're here, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Dr. Shorman wanted to pick a sample from the lava dome to have it dated. Now you guys know that Dr. Austin did that at Mount St. Helens. He wanted to repeat that experiment here at Nova, Nova Rupta. So while they, while they were there, they picked a sample of rhyolite to have dated later on. Okay, the eruption was in 1912, and they got the sample in 2009, that's when they were there, and they sent it to a lab in tw uh, 2012, which Dr. Shorman did that on purpose. That was exactly 100 years after the eruption. Okay, so they sent it to the lab. The lab that dated it was the New Mexico uh, Geochronological Research Lab, and they dated it using the argon-argon method. They got dates as high as 50.5 million years. <laughs> How old was the rock? 
Ah, there's a skeptic in the audience. A skeptic behind the camera. Edit. Okay, so if the assumption of zero uh, initial argon was true, then the sample should have uh, virtually no daughter uh, argon produced from the decay of the radioactive potassium. It actually had 3.6 argon, which translates into the ages of uh, 50.5 million years. The test was wrong by a factor of 55,000 times. Now what's interesting is uh, when I got to go on a hike myself with Dr. Shorman, he explained that before they dated the rock, the lab wanted to know how old he thought the rock was. <laughs> now I don't understand everything about uh, dating like that, using the argon-argon method, but he said that you have to heat the rock uh, for different amounts of times based on the age of the rock. And so they needed to know that to know how long to heat the rock during the testing that they were going to do. But I thought that that was very interesting, that you kind of have to know the age of the rock, basically and generally, so that they know how to perform the test to date the rock. I thought that that was very interesting. <clears throat> okay, so later that night, uh, both teams finally met back up. It was the first time uh, the whole team came together back at the cabins. And uh, I've got to tell you a story very quickly. The one team was supposed to meet Dr. Shorman at the cabins because Dr. Shorman and Kenny were already um, you know, visiting Nova Raptor, and the plan was to be back at the cabins. Well, as the team was uh, going across the wilderness there, they saw what they believed to be Dr. Shorman way in the distance. And so they spent their day going after that person and going, Dr. Shorman! Dr. Shorman, we're here! And the people just kept going. And they kept following them for almost the entire day, and they kept thinking, why won't they just slow down? The team leader, Mike, couldn't understand why they wouldn't stop. And so they had to really pick up their speed, and they finally caught up with the team, and you already know the punchline, it wasn't Dr. Shorman. They had wasted their whole time trekking the wrong distance, but finally they made it to the cabins, and finally the team was all together. Here's a, here's a picture of them uh, throwing snowballs near the Nova Rupta area. Okay, now I promised you action. I hope you've kind of heard some action. Adventure, right? Science, we've talked about that a little bit. But I also promised you romance, right? Okay, so here we go with the romance. Is Kenny had a girl uh, that he had fallen in love with in Hawaii, and her name was Ashley. And there's a picture of Ashley. Now, Kenny really thought that Ashley might be the girl for him. Now, when you're out in the wilderness like that, you want to have a way to contact help if you're in trouble, right? So they had a satellite phone, okay? And uh, that was to be used only for emergencies. What the rest of the team didn't know was whenever he could, Kenny was sneaking away and making phone calls to Ashley on the satellite phone. <laughs> and they would sit and talk about how the expedition was going and he'd find out how she was doing in Hawaii and eventually he ran out all of the minutes on the phone. So he secretly knew for the rest of the expedition that if an emergency happened, that there would be no way to contact anybody for help. So it wasn't until after the trip that he confessed to the rest of the team that he had secretly been talking to Ashley uh, through much of the night a lot of times, okay? So that's kind of funny. Okay, the next morning they woke up and uh, the whole team now returned back to Nova Rupta. There they are um, actually walking on the rim of the, uh, the vent that's there. So what exactly happened here on June 6th of 1912? The eruption took place in 60 hours, which have been divided into five different episodes. Episode one, the, uh, the uh, eruption took place, uh, and uh, it began on episode one, I'm sorry, my notes got confused here. Episode one lasted for 16 hours and accounted for 70% of the material that would be ejected from the volcano. Mount Katmai is six miles north of the Nova Rupt event. So you've got, uh, you've got Mount Katmai, and then six miles away is the actual Nova Rupta event. At one o'clock in the afternoon of June 6, 1912, some of the material began to erupt from Mount Katmai. Okay? So it was actually Mount Katmai that began to erupt. It was the real volcano. But in the middle of the eruption, all of a sudden, it collapsed on itself. All the material fell back inside the volcano, uh, it plugged itself up, we've all seen that happen with the toilet, right? And it shot out somewhere else, and the place where it shot out was the Nova Rupt event, okay? So this was the real volcano that 
was going to have its big day, and it never did. Nova Erupta is actually a volcano that got to erupt. Under the extreme pressure, the material began to blow out a lower vent, Nova Erupta. As the pressure was relieved from underneath Katmai, there was a cubic mile of material that fell 1,000 feet into the void. Okay, so 1,000 feet of material just fell right back into the throat of Katmai, and then it blasted out of the Nova Erupta vent six miles away. During this eruption, it deposited nine distinct deposits, filling the valley of 10,000 smokes. It caused flows moving at the speeds of 450 miles per hour. It began with rhyolo, uh, rhyolite material and eventually began releasing a day site. It was about six hours into this, that, uh, this episode when Mount Katmai collapsed, releasing mud flows, ash, and hydrothermic rock matrix. During the first 11 hours of the eruption, there was 567 tons of material ejected from Nova Erupta uh, every second. 567 tons of material every second. At the end of episode one, there was a short pause of a few hours, which brought us to episode two. Episode two was a Plinian eruption, shooting gas and dacite material up into the air. Although there were earthquakes throughout the entire eruption, the largest took place during episode number two, heading, hitting 7.0 on the Richter scale. It blew out almost three miles of material, which covered an area of 3,000 square miles. This event also caused pyroclastic density currents, waves of fast-moving gas carrying rock that shot downward at high speeds, depositing layer after layer of material, like what we saw at Mount St. Helens, right? Depositing those layers very rapidly. After a short break, episode three, uh, uh, after a short break, episode three shot another six-tenths of a cubic mile of material straight up into the air to fall back, creating even more layers. It also shot out more waves of gas and material. Episode three has, uh, ended as material built up around Nova Rupta's vent, forming a dome, plugging the volcano. <clears throat> Episode four blew out the plug, <laughs> depositing the material around the vent. And finally, episode five was another dome building event which uh, replaced the old dome and ended the eruption. So that's what took place on that day that everything erupted. Kind of makes you think about what we read in Genesis, right? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, <clears throat> the seventh day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. You know, uh, I was teaching my class the other day, uh, and we were talking about the worldwide flood, and I asked the students, so where did all the water come from from the flood? And they said, rain. I said, well, well true. But how much water could we get from rain? Well, Dr. Larry Vardaman has done studies on that. The most water you could get out of rain would be about an inch globally, right? And so we forget all the time that there was actually fountains of the great deep that opened up. Like most volcanoes, Nova Erupta, Nova Erupta released a lot of water. And during the eruption, it was millions of tons of water. Also prior to erupting, some of it was likely in a state known as the... Uh, the supercritical phase, okay? Water has a, 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 a state called supercritical phase. The critical point for water is 705.2 degrees Fahrenheit with a pressure of 3,191 pounds per square inch. At high pressures, pressures and temperatures like this, water no longer acts like a liquid or a gas, but something in between. Near this critical point, it becomes very corrosive and can actually eat through rock. These were processes that were going on at Nova Rupta. Probably the same processes during the flood, right? It was probably the corrosiveness of the supercritical water that helped eat away the material inside Katmai Peak. That's probably what caused that to collapse in on itself. The effects of the water and other products bursting forth from Nova Rupta could be similar to what was happening with the fountains of the Great Deep during the worldwide flood. It's really kind of cool how God's got these volcanoes that teach us so much about what could have been happening during the flood. Okay, so the next few days were spent uh, by the team uh, climbing Mount, uh, Mount Katmai. They actually climbed Mount Katmai and took a look and photographed that. They were exploring gl glaciers. They were visiting the original uh, base camp of Briggs Expedition next to Baked Mountain. So basically, uh, they spent uh, their time exploring, taking photographs, and Dr. Shorman was doing a lot of documenting uh, later on so he could present uh, his paper to the ICC. 
So uh, he actually presented all of his data and actually there was an ICC article, paper that he presented uh, that you can download. And uh, I suggest you do that if you want to know more about uh, all the science behind Nova Rupta. Here's another picture of them running. They would basically run down the slopes of the snow, the glaciers, and they would take their ice axes and stick it in and basically they were just having fun. They were just enjoying themselves. So here's Baked Mountain. Baked Mountain is 3,500 uh, 3, feet and 1,000 feet above the valley. And uh, as they were hiking up there, guess what they found on top? Anybody? Marine fossils, yeah. Pretty cool that they found marine fossils up there. Kind of reminds you of what the scripture says when it says 15 cubits upward that the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. So it's kind of awesome that they were finding them there. Here's another interesting scripture. Psalm 104, 6 through 9, Thou covereth it <coughs> with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hastened away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys, unto which the place that thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass, that they, that they turn not again to cover the earth. Wow, a lot of creation geologists teach that we had the worldwide flood and then after the flood was the uplift of mountains and that the floodwaters went back into the ocean basins similar to what we have today. Very interesting. It seems like that scripture uh, goes pretty nicely with that. <clears throat> Here they are uh, crossing one of the, uh, the rivers. Now when you look at this, you go, ah, oh, that's not too action-packed. That's not much of a thing. Well, think about this. They had to hike for miles and miles and miles to find a place where they had to cross. Now sometimes you saw that they just waded through the rivers themselves, but a lot of times they just jumped over this. But like they said, that water was moving so quick that if they had missed and slipped and fallen, it would have just swept them right down the river. So it was kind of a, a stressful thing for them. As they crossed the river left, they were surrounded by the layers deposited by the eruption. Many of these layers are known as valley-filling ignimbrite. Ignimbrite is the term for a volcanic material like rhyolite is, uh, when it's trapped in hot gases as they rapidly flow outward from an eruption. Ignimbrites are by far the scariest of all volcanic vents. Uh, rhyolite uh, never forms lava-like uh, like the basidic flows of Hawaii because it's too sticky. But when rhyolite magma at depth has sufficiently dissolved in water and when that liquid suddenly flashes to steam, the whole mass undergoes instant expansion, kind of like a bomb. Once the energized material exited the vent, some of it formed into a ground-hugging slurry of hot gas, vapor, and ash that flowed at terrific speeds. While it traveled outward from the blast, water and the ash particles continued to expand, keeping the whole mass energized. So ignimbrites can cover incredible distances even across water, uh, bodies of water in no time. Okay, so Nova Rupta deposits uh, consist mainly of two types, fall deposits and flow deposits. The valley filling ignimbrites are flow deposits that poured out of Nova Rupta's vent. In some places along the river left, these nine ignimbrite packages, which Griggs calls sand flows, okay, that's what Dr. Griggs called them, are actually over 100 feet thick. Wow. Some of the layers are very soft sandstone-like rock that you can crumble in your hands. By the way, this is the only ignimbrite flow to occur in recorded history. Okay, so we talk about these flows, but this was the one that we caught in, his, in history. Some of these materials were so hot that the particles actually welded together, which is called welded ignimbrite. Okay, so the other deposits were fall deposits. They're composed of ash and pumice, mainly from Nova Rupta, but they also include a special deposit called a HEPI de deposit, which stands for high energy proximal ignimbrite. HEPIs are a type of pyroclastic density current formed after superheated clouds of gas and ash collapse on themselves and rush across the surrounding valley and the mountains. HEPI deposits blanket everything in their path with thin layers that frequently stack up to several feet in thickness. Okay. So it's amazing that it's creating these very thin layers, lots of them. Wow. Again, like at Mount St. Helens, we're seeing that layers can form very rapidly. 
Okay, it doesn't seem so far-fetched to consider a year-long global cataclysm and all the things that were going on with Noah's flood. So when we look at Nova Rapta, we see that layers can form very quick, just in moments. We see rapid erosion carrying, uh, carving canyons, like at the River Lathe. We see massive lands, landslides that are damming rivers and mountains collapsing. It demonstrates the power of what can happen during a huge catastrophe like this. Well, after they had visited these things, after they crossed the rivers, they went back to, uh, to uh, civilization again. Uh, they were back at uh, a place where many people go to visit Katmai Park, and they spent the night. Now, I've got to tell you, one of their team members, Tommy, was feeling so sick, by the time they got back to uh, civilization again, he was just feeling horrible. And they knew they had to spend a, a night somewhere uh, where they could just relax, but they... They had their tents and stuff, but they were tired of camping. Well, when they got there at the visitor center, nobody was around, but they tried the visitor center door and it was unlocked. And so that night they snuck into the visitor center and actually spent the night on the floor there and all the guys were just so glad to be inside four walls with no wind. Well, the next morning they got up and they, uh, they took a tour um, that was being offered by the uh, National Park Service. There they are on their tour. And they took a trip down, a hike down to uh, what's called Yukak Falls. Okay, now at the bottom of Yukak Falls there, you can see that, that rock right there that it's, uh, that it's running through is actually called the Naknek Formation. Okay? The Naknek Formation stretches from the Alaskan Range in the east all the way past the Pribilof Islands into the Bering Sea over 1,000 miles. It's over 14,000 feet uh, thick in some areas. So it's a huge deposit. This deposit said to be uh, composed of rapidly eroding coastal sediments mixed with considerable volume of volcanic debris. The Naknex uh, is a sediment gravity flow that occurs when water mixes with sediment. In a sediment gravity flow, the entire mass of the particles and liquid behaves as a single fluid. <coughs> the amount of material that can be moved by these flows is incredible and shows the power of catastrophic forces. So when I talk to you about a humongous layer, it's over 14,000 feet thick, made from ocean materials, mixed in with ash, what event comes into your mind that deposited that? It looks like the Naknek formation is left over from the worldwide flood. And it's right there, easy to see. <clears throat> we also find a bunch of marine fossils in that layer as well. Well, after visiting Naknek Falls and taking pictures and data and all of that, it was finally time to head home. And so the gentlemen jumped on planes, uh, their planes, and they, uh, they flew back home. But the adventure is not over because there was a second uh, expedition, and we'll talk about that right after intermission.